So why don't I talk about um, what it was like growing up in the Soviet Union? Well, I was born in 1975, so by the time Gorbachev came to power, I was 10. By the time the Berlin Wall fell, I was 14. When the anti-Gorbachev pro-USSR reactionist coup happened in 1991, I was 16. And I left Russia when I was 30. Came over here in 2005. So if you can do math, you know how old I am. Okay. Um, I'll give you, you know, a few, like, tidbits of anecdotal uh, history um, that hopefully will paint a picture for you. A picture that you are probably not familiar with. So, okay. Um... I lived in Leningrad, which is, which was at its founding called St. Petersburg, and then it was called St. Petersburg, German, and then Petrograd, which is the Russification of St. Petersburg, uh, and it was renamed Petrograd uh, during the First World War because Russia was at war with Germany and it was not proper to call its capital by a German name, St. Petersburg, um, and then it was renamed Leningrad after Lenin died in 1924 and it was renamed back to St. Petersburg in 1991 by by decree of the then mayor of, of Leningrad, Anatoly Sobchak a big Yeltsin supporter and a crook um, okay so I lived in Leningrad um, which was relatively prosperous by the USSR standards Absolutely, it was it was it was prosperous. Now Moscow was probably even better, allegedly better. Okay, it was better, but not by much. But you'll see very soon that it doesn't mean much when I say it was better, and when I say prosperous, it doesn't really mean much. I mean it's all it's all relative. But you know we didn't know any any different as a kid, so I didn't know that I was living in abject poverty. So I I, I don't have. A memory of living in, living in poverty. I have a memory of living the way we lived, and the way we lived was my parents uh, my dad and my stepmom and my brother, who was nine years my senior. so when I started uh, what would be called here elementary school, and over there it was just called school because there is no division into still is no division. And there was no division back then, in you know between elementary school, middle school, and high school. It, it was all one school. In fact, you would typically stay together with the same group of people, your class, for ten years. It was ten years then; it's eleven now. So you would start school at seven, you would finish at seventeen, and then you would go to, again, what we would refer to as college in the U.S. Uh, most of those places were called institutes or universities. Universities were better. Anyway, so when I started school, my brother was graduating high school that same year. Um, so we lived in an apartment, and they were called Khrushchev apartment. Khrushchev or Khrushchevki? Nah, pretty much, something like that. Anyway, Khrushchev apartment, apartment blocks. It was a concrete building, five stories high, no, no lift, no elevator. Um, the uh, construction was pretty shoddy. A lot of those buildings are still standing, but they're horrible to live in, and some of them are unsafe, I, I believe. Um, we lived in a in an apartment, a two-room apartment. Now, in in Russia today, and gen, in in the Soviet Union back then, you don't measure your um, your home by the number of bedrooms. Now, a concept of a bedroom, as I'll explain, and I hope it will become clear to you pretty 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 quickly, is somewhat foreign to uh, the um, reality of most Russians' situation back then and even today. Nobody nobody talks in, in terms of bedrooms. Everybody talks in terms of rooms. Having a dedicated bedroom is an unknown luxury. It's like uh, if if somebody told me like where's your bed ask me where's your bedroom. The concept of a bedroom didn't apply to our reality. So we lived in an apartment whose overall area was probably around, you know, under 300 square feet, 27 square meters. 
uh, and it consisted of a very very small foyer, uh, probably uh, 20 square feet. There was a coat rack on the wall, a chair, to sit down and tie your shoelaces, a mirror, a little shelf with a phone, uh, a, a small corridor leading past the bath bathroom and the toilet, and bathroom and toilet meaning you know your bath, you know the room where your bathtub and the sink are and the room where your toilet bowl is, those were separate rooms. Um, in fact, they tend to be separate even today. Um, it was a revelation for me when I first uh, went abroad. I think it was night, uh, what was it? Uh, I can't even believe, I can't even remember. I think it was uh, 1989. When I first went abroad to the UK and I found that people kept their bathtubs and toilet bowls in the same room, that was, that was surprising to me. What if you're taking a shower and somebody needs to use a toilet? And that kind of sucks. Anyway, so so the, the corridor led past the tiny little toilet and the bathroom into a small kitchen. And when I say small, I mean 50 square feet, maybe 55. Or from the foyer, you could enter into what we would refer to as the big room. The big room was about 170 square feet. And then right past it, behind a cardboard wall, essentially, essentially cardboard, because uh, the way it transmitted sound, uh, you could characterize it as, it as cardboard, uh, was another room, which we would call small room. A small room was probably 130 square feet. And there were four of us, like I said in that apartment and that was okay that was actually we we were doing fine that wasn't anything special like we weren't especially poor that was normal my dad was an engineer worked as an engineer in fact like he, what he was was a writer but he could never hope to be able to support himself as a writer or get an official job as a writer for reasons that I'll explain later if I remember and have the time to do so he he had a day job as an electrical engineer at a, at a plant, a manufacturing facility, and my stepmom was also an engineer at uh, Lomo. Some of you may know what Lomo is. Let me know if you do. I will be I, I will be impressed. But anyway, it was a thing, uh, a let's say a manufacturing firm. It's obviously state owned. Everything was state owned. All jobs were government jobs, pretty much. There, were, there was no private economy in the USSR. No private economy, with very small exceptions of, um, of like small-time farmers that would grow their own crops and were allowed to sell them at markets. But uh, there was no private manufacturing, private you know, design, whatever. Nothing, nothing. Everything was state. Um, so, so the two of them, they were, you know, they were making a decent living by by the standards of that time. My dad, working as a writer, sports writer, journalist, um, was you know, making a supplemental income, so we were not doing too badly by the standards of, of, of the epoch. Um, and yet that was all that you could get. Now, how, how, would you, how would you get to, how would you come to live in an apartment? Well, you were given an apartment. They were distributed through the state. The state built all the houses apartment blocks, and they would assign apartments. And there was tremendous corruption around that. And for example, my mom, when, when my dad and my mom first got married, for some reason the bureaucrat in charge of the prapiska, which is the registration for where you live, and you have to be registered, and you still have to be registered. You can't just live somewhere. You have to go to a state office and get a stamp in your passport. Now, Russians have passports as a form of ID. That's your, you know, national ID. Um, again, the concept coming here, the concept that you can, you know, your ID can be your driver's license, and you don't need any other ID, was completely foreign and uh, amazing to me. That you don't need a passport, like a uniform, a uniform ID for everybody. Um, in Russia, you're not advised to leave your house without a passport in your pocket. So you, you want to be able to prove to the authorities who you are at any time. Where I was just watching a video of a guy who was open carrying a gun 
in Maine, in Portland, Maine, and, and some fuck called the police on him. Um, and the cop stopped him and, and took away his gun for a few minutes, and he refused, he refused to give him his ID, he refused to give them his name, he demanded they give the gun back, and he happened to be a law student who knew all the Supreme Court cases that ruled why the police, basically, t you know, tell the police why they have no right to stop him unless they uh, suspect him of having committed a crime, in which case they have to tell him. And he kept asking them, have I committed, a are you suspecting me of committing a crime? Obviously, he knew he had committed no crime. Uh, but maybe there's, there was some suspicion that somebody else has committed a crime and he's a suspect. Well, they couldn't tell him that because he was no suspect. And there was a log of the call from the schmuck who called the cops on him that, oh, oh, they were worried because they saw a man with a gun, open carrying a gun on his, on his side in his holster. And that's why they called the cops. Idiots. Anyway, after like three or four minutes of altercations with the cops, he was given his gun back without having revealed his identity to them, without having shown them his ID, and he walked away. Um, still today, uh, Russia today, unthinkable, let alone carrying a gun. But anyway, uh, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, so uh, yeah, when my mom and my dad, my, my mom died when I was four, uh, but uh, when before I was even born, they came to, they were given this apartment and this bureaucrat, for some reason, he hated my mom. And I heard the story from my dad, and I don't know all the details, or don't remember. And he said, "You, I will never register you here, so you will remain illegal. Like, when the pigs fly, I will register you here when the pigs fly. He was a hateful son of a bitch. Um, for some, you know, they found a way to work around him, got somebody else to stamp the papers for my mom. Anyway, so they got they got this apartment. It was distributed to them by the state and so we were doing okay now my brother and I lived in the small room the, the 130 square feet room which had my bed a smaller bed um, you know before well th th there was a bed like probably like single or yeah single size bed American uh, American standard um, which my brother used to sleep on when I was little. Then I grew up, and my baby bed went away. And they, you know, my parents got him uh, like a, a a a bed, which oh, there's there's a hinge, and you you pick it up, and it goes at an angle like this. And there's a drawer underneath the mattress, which is built into the bed. The mattress is built into the bed. It's part of the bed. It's not uh, separate. You know, you can't separate it from the bed. And underneath the mattress, there were built-in drawers for like the bedding, uh, the pillow, and the, the blanket, and everything. And the, every morning, all of that stuff went in there. You know, the, it would get folded. The sofa would go up. Well, I mean, the the mattress would go up on a hinge. The bedding would go in. We fold it back down, and there you have it. You have a like a flat sofa with no back to sit on, to like lay on, to read and stuff. And my bed was the only bed in the house that actually got made, as in the bedding didn't get taken off the bed and put somewhere. Now, in in the big room where my parents slept, it was basically a folding sofa bed, which would, uh, during the day, it, was, it would fold up, uh, and one half of the bed would form the back, and the other would form the seat, the cushion, and then it would fold, would get folded flat uh, at night when my parents would go to bed. And the bedding also went inside, underneath the mattress, into the drawers, built into the bed. So that was, that was pretty standard. Nobody had bedrooms. There was no dedicated room where you slept. There was the room, and you did stuff in it, the stuff that you needed to do. So in our room were the two beds, a very, very small closet, which was not used for clothes, again, Closets, using closets for clothes is, is very, very new in Russia now. Only uh, very few people do that. Mostly people have like wardrobes, pieces of furniture where you store your, your clothes. So we had a big wardrobe and a desk and a chair. And the desk was used by my brother and then me to do homework for school. There were some shelves above the desk for books and stuff. We had no device to play music on for, well, uh, not until I was like eight, I think, when my brother made some money 
during the summer and bought himself a tape player, which was a huge, huge deal. It was actually Soviet-made. It was called Sonata, just like the Hyundai car. And most of the stuff that he would listen to was Vysotsky's songs and Galich's songs. I don't know if you know who Vysotsky is or who Galich is. Look him up. Anyway, uh, in the big room, there was this folding sofa that I told you about. There was, there was a, a, like a bookcase. And along one of the walls ran a combination drawer slash bookcase. So in the bottom, you would have drawers. You know, two drawers, two drawers high, and you would steal. We would keep uh, clothes and bedding and stuff like that in in the drawers, and above them sat uh, the bookcase. Mostly it was books. In fact, my dad, most of what he bought ever were books. And when he died, and I had to move to the U.S., I sold his library, and it filled, literally filled a truck, that library, and I took all those books to. I used a bookstore, and I've completely replenished their inventory. Like, I would wa later walk into this, that same store, and their entire showroom was looked like my living room. Well, I say living room; it was just the room, okay, the big room. Um, but it looked like I was, you know, I'm, I was looking at the same books that I grew up looking at for many, many years. So that was it. That was the apartment. And again, that was normal. That was not poor. That was normal. Some people had bigger apartments that would have three rooms instead of two. Also, those rooms sometimes would be separated, as in you didn't have to walk through one to get to the other, which was the case with us. And I told you about the cardboard wall. I mean, I, I don't know how my parents ever had sex, if they ever had sex, because you could hear, you could hear people breathing um, on the other side of the wall. And... I would, uh, they would make me go to bed when I was little, at nine. I'd go brush my teeth, you know, wash my face, whatever, and then I would go into the room as the youngest member of the family and go to bed, and I would listen to the movie being played on TV. I'm trying to visualize what was happening there. For years, I remember doing that, just lying awake, listening to the TV, Trying to picture what was going on on the screen. Um, now, to give you an idea of how, of the level of prosperity, or the lack thereof, um, at that time, I'll, oh, okay, I'll share two things. One is a sort of an economic example, a few economic examples, so that you can understand what the patterns of consumption, consumption were, what the levels of consumption and prosperity were uh, in the USSR at the time, and the other. Uh, Will, will be like a, a description of the degree to which I was aware politically and how I experienced the USSR state propaganda machine. First, the economic thing. One of the, one of the uh, desirable items that was not always available, and when it was available, it was kind of a big deal, was, brace yourselves, toilet paper. Now, I know you don't believe me, but I have no reason to lie. Toilet paper was largely unavailable. Think about it for a second. Now, think about it for a second. Now, if this is not a good argument for the impossibility of economic calculation under socialism, I don't know what is. Now, think of a, can you think of a more perfect product than toilet paper? Now, if you're an entrepreneur and you find yourself on a planet or in a country where people don't have toilet paper, you're going to make out like a bandit because it's an ideal product. Every fucking body uses it every single day, always and always will, right? So you have a guaranteed market. People will always buy toilet paper. Can you imagine not using toilet paper? You'd have to use something for it, right? So... The only way you can end up without a toilet paper in the economy is when somebody has to remember to produce it, where there is no profit motive. But you have to remember to produce it, or you have to think to produce it, right? Well, the government couldn't keep track of everything that they needed to do, 
um, and they just didn't provide for toilet paper. Sometimes they wouldn't forget, they would forget, or you know, all of it would go to Moscow, or all of it go to, would go to Politburo, or you know, and how much toilet paper do we make, and where do we ship it? It was it was a nightmare. So you know, for years, that toilet paper was this. When you had toilet paper, oh, that was good. You know, when you have toilet paper in the house. Oh, you're doing great. And even w when we didn't have toilet paper, we tried to conserve it because you, you'd never know when it was going to be available again. So I mentioned that my dad was a writer, so he would write a lot. And again, uh, you know, mid-80s, no computers, no nothing. Um, my dad did have a typewriter, but he never used it, so he preferred to write with his hand. And he would discard a lot of drafts. And those drafts would be torn up into little squares and put in the toilet room. And we would use those for toilet paper. Now, how, how, how can you do that, right? It's, uh, it's not soft. Well, you soften it. You go like this. Take a sheet of paper, go like this, and it softens up, and then you can use it. That was normal growing up. I mean, it, I don't have any particular strong feelings about it. I just thinking back, it's just ridiculous that millions, hundreds of millions of people had to live like that because of socialism. Okay. Now I heard a few years ago, maybe two or three years ago, there was a, a toilet paper crisis on Cuba, on the island of freedom, and that's you know the only situation where you can end up without a product like toilet paper is when there is no private production. Okay. Hopefully you get it by now. Anyway, so that was one. Another anecdote for you is... Uh, oh, another luxury item commonly referred to, and everybody knew that this was luxury, was salami. Salami. You know, the sticks of salami. What is this? Dead mosquito. Um, so yeah the month where you could get salami oh gee that was a good month like and also you couldn't afford it really not readily not everybody it was expensive so for special occasions like birthday parties um, whatever like New Year's Eve celebrations which is a big thing it was a secular Christmas it's a huge thing New Year's Eve um, you would go out and get a stick of salami And you would, but you would have to really think, can I afford to get this stick of salami this month or this week? Um, another thing, um, oh, clothes. Clothes were terrible. Clothes were terrible. There was no imports. Western goods were not allowed into the country. There was limited trade with the um, Soviet bloc nations. And... All of the all of the stuff that was any good at all was imported from places like East Germany, Hungary. Hungary was an exotic place. I remember getting a, a fluorescent marker for my birthday. It was this weird orange color that was unknown in the Soviet Union. Those colors, like yellow, bright yellow, like fluorescent yellow, fluorescent orange, they were foreign. And uh, my dad's good friend, who actually lives in uh, Oregon now. He and his wife, they're childless. They, he, he met my dad in in the university, and they remained friends until, you know, they moved out of the country, and then my dad died. Um, so he gave me a couple of a couple of uh, fluorescent markers for my birthday. Those were imported from Hungary, and those were exotic and extremely cool. My cool factor in school went through the roof when I brought those in, and showed them to my classmates. Um, my brother uh, studied German in school, and uh, when he was 15, a group of students from his class went to East Germany for a few weeks. It was a huge thing. The trip to East Germany, that was a trip abroad, man. Nobody, nobody goes abroad. Nobody goes abroad. Nobody travels abroad. Abroad is evil. Um, and abroad is not allowed. So, but East Germany was as good as anything, you know, it's, it was abroad. And he, so he spent, I think, two or three weeks living, live, living with a family. I think it was in Dresden, but I'm not sure. He came back with clothes made in East Germany. You know, 
I wore those clothes, some of those clothes later when I grew into them. I'm a little bit bigger than my brother, but it took me a couple of years, a few years to catch up with him size-wise. So um, those clothes are really good compared to the shit that I wore. Typically, oh yeah, those clothes were amazing, man. Now I was talking to somebody at Porkfest, who's a, who's a German. This guy, his name is Max. I forget where he's from. From you know, in Germany, but uh, I think he's he's from the western part of Germany. And he was telling us, uh, David and I, um, about um, how the unification. You know, at at the time of the uh, unification of Germany, people uh, really uh, had no idea how difficult it would it was going to be to unify the economies. Um, and initially they thought, oh, they're pretty close. I mean, Germans are Germans, so you know, it can't be that bad. And when the the Berlin Wall uh, came down and the unification was underway, they started to realize how terrible the East German economy was and how horrible the products were that they were uh, producing. You know, obviously, the infamous Trabant and stuff like that. But for us, in, in the USSR, the East German goods were the epitome of quality. Same goes for Hungarian goods. Same goes for Czech goods. Now, uh, the um, the combination drawer slash bookcase that I mentioned was actually made from made in East Germany, and that was considered wow. Oh, that's uh, that's high standard, man. That's high standard. Our chandelier in the big room was made in Czech Republic. It was awesome. It was awesome. Nobody wanted Soviet goods. Everybody wanted Czech goods. Um, Hungarian. Um, I think the only country that didn't really have much street cred in terms of its imports was Bulgaria. Nothing interesting came from Bulgaria, with the exception of uh, fruits and vegetables, mostly vegetables. And uh, yeah, the, in fact, the word for bell peppers in Russian is still Bulgarian peppers. Or at least uh, until quite recently it was. I'm not sure now, even though I, I go back to Russia several times a year for business. I'm not sure. I'm not up to speed on the uh, uh, groceries vernacular. Not so much anymore. Anyway, so that was the economic picture. And politically, like my dad was what I was, you know, internally referred to as dissident, meaning he hated the Soviets. He hated the state, the Soviet state. Um, and we would have so-called kitchen talks. Not we, but they would have. He and his friends, and he, he or he and mom, would have kitchen talks. In the kitchen, you you you, know, you you talked quietly, talked about anything, and you called things by their proper names. And they, you know, the, my dad would say things about how horrible the Politburo was and how horrible Brezhnev was and all that. So I grew up listening to all this stuff. And uh, the, over, the overarching feeling that I remember having about the political reality was that every single word in every single newspaper and the TV broadcast was a lie. I knew that very deeply. So this distance between what my father said and thought and expressed and what the official propaganda was putting out, uh, the contrast between those two, thi two things was... You know, to say that it was stark is is really not to say anything. So I knew that everything was a lie, and I, you know, as far as I can remember, I uh, my instinct every time they said that, that something in the West was evil, my instinct was to say to think that the exact opposite was true. So people knew that the West was not bad. People knew that life in the West was not horrible compared to the USSR. People knew those things. Only the idiots, the um, the rare idiots, really believed that the USSR was a worker's paradise. And, and in the West, people just languished and, and suffered uh, daily, you know, you know, a horrible daily existence where they had to work for the man, whatever. Whereas he, over here, we're all working for the glorious state, building a glorious socialist slash communist future. Uh, but I didn't believe that. Uh, and nobody I knew believed that. Pretty much nobody to believe that. And it was very common for most people to want to at least go to the West and see for themselves what it was like. 
And most people I knew were sure the West was very cool. And it was actually very cool to live, would be very cool to live there. And many people wanted to leave the USSR for good and go live over in the West somewhere. Preferably America, but it, it didn't really matter because the West was this big lump called the West. And we didn't really make any distinctions between you know, more exotic places like Norway or Denmark or, you know, or more traditional places like the UK. Uh, or 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 uh, the United States. So this big West out there that the propaganda machine kept telling us was evil, and kept telling us people were suffering over there, and that everybody wanted to go and live there. That was it. Ah, another anecdote. Uh, when I was older, fourteen, fifteen, we started in in our school. We studied English. I started learning English when I was eight. Always loved. It. Always loved it. Uh, I may have ta a talent for languages, even though I only speak one other than my native Russian. I speak a little bit of German. Aber ganz, ganz wenig. Ganz wenig. Ich hab schon alles vergessen, leider. Um, anyways, uh, we started having um, delegations from abroad come into our school for like half a day and spend time with us Soviet students. Um, and we were practicing our English, speaking to kids from Denmark and Norway and England. And I ended up going to England for two weeks in 1989, spending two weeks in the town of Taunton uh, in Somerset uh, in a family, uh, with a family. Um, and then that was in the fall. And then the following spring, six months later, uh, those same kids came over and stayed with us. And the kid from, from England, Jonathan, uh, came and stayed with us. We partied like crazy, we drank, we smoked, we, oh, we did horrible and beautiful things. We were teenagers. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was a huge shock for me to go over there at age 15. Was I 15? No. No, I was 14. It was a huge shock to see the people had cars. Oh, oh, another thing, cars. Nobody had cars. Like to have a car was to be a millionaire. That's, you know, the equivalent emotionally. Nobody had cars. The cities were not built for cars, which is why in a lot of places in Russia today there's huge problems with parking because nobody provided for the space for parking when they planned and built um, high-rise buildings and apartment blocks by the thousands and thousands and thousands. I I probably knew a couple of people in my class in school growing up who had whose parents had cars, but to have a car was like like I said you know you have a car, you you're Bill Gates. Um, so anyway, one of those delegations from the UK when I was fourteen and fifteen, our our English teacher was laughing and telling us the story of how she was speaking to her opposite number, a teacher uh, with the British delegation, and they were discussing the World War Two, which. In the USSR and Russia today, everybody refers to as the Great Patriotic War. Uh, there's two, by the way. There's two Great Patriotic Wars. The, uh, the Great Patriotic War number one was the 1812 War with Napoleon, and the second one was the World War II, or rather, part of it that included Russia, 1941 to 1945. So. Our English teacher was laughing, telling us the story how that her counterpart, the uh, British teacher, was telling her that her parents remembered, or it may have been herself, remembered World War II as a terrible, terrible, terrible time, and they were suffering uh, tremendous hardships, and you know, everyday items would be unavailable because of the hardships of war. For example, she said, for example, we couldn't even, we couldn't even couldn't always even get bananas and pineapples in the grocery store. And at that point, our English teacher just laughed. And everybody laughed. Everybody was on the floor laughing. You know why? Because bananas were never available in the Soviet Union. Now, again, they would sell bananas you know, a couple of times a year, some kind of import season. I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know where they imported the bananas from. I think Ecuador. But bananas were not an everyday item. Bananas were a treat. 
a rare treat. Same goes for watermelons. Watermelons generally were only available around August. Uh, they grew them somewhere in Volga, and they would import them. And uh, you know, to get a, to get a, a watermelon was again a treat. You get a water, watermelon, and you eat it. Your entire family shares it and eats it. And you know, picking a watermelon is an art, and you because you you know you want to pick a right one that's uh, sweet and delicious. And I remember September, right around the time when you went back to school after the summer vacation, was the time you would typically get uh, watermelon several times. And that was it. That watermelon season gone. You know, no more watermelons for the rest of the year. Same goes for bananas and pineapples. I don't think I ever had pineapple. Uh, no. No. Not in the USSR. No. Russia later, yeah. Yeah, you can get pretty much anything. Eventually, mid-90s, mid late 90s. Um, but uh, in the USSR, forget it. I'd never seen a pineapple. Okay. Um, anyway, these are just a few anecdotes for you. If you're interested in learning more, if you have any questions, feel free to comment, you know, uh, message me, whatever. I'll tell you more. I don't know what is interesting and what is not. This is, this is part of what I grew up with. This is natural for me, you know, so I may not even understand. Um, uh, like I, I was speaking with Lengthy and Arthur about this at Portfest, and he said, look, dude, you know, you have a perspective that people simply don't have. They have no idea how life was in the Soviet Union, and uh, a lot of what you may have to say could influence people, give them something valuable in the way of information that could uh, influence their viewpoint. Well, if that's the case, let me know. I don't even know if I'm going to be uh, able to uh, upload a 37-minute video, but there you have it. Let me know if you want to hear more.